saying to farmers is not saying to farmers, don't share your data. It's not saying you're sitting on you're sitting on this data, like keep it secure, keep it safe, don't give it to anyone. That's not it at all. What we're saying is let's set some policies and and rules around the sharing that will make it safer for farmers to share that data. And so we can do that through making sure contracts have the right bits and pieces in them and that the policies for data management that are coming from those um, who are managing the farm data um, adhere to the code and those requirements that farmers have set. And so that code is the data governance foundation that's over and above the, the lacking legal baseline uh, for farm data that we can then use to encourage data sharing. Here we go. So if you haven't seen it before, the farm data code is available on the NFF uh, website, I've got the link there for you. Uh, and it looks like that picture on the left there. It's a very brief document. It's, it's got six high level principles with um, a whole lot of statements under each one. And I'll, I'll cover what uh, the topics are in a second. And then we also have the accompanying certification program is where we actually look at the data management policies and the terms and conditions for providers. And when, we, when I say providers, I mean anyone that's collecting, managing or sharing farm data. So it includes researchers as well. Not just, it's not just about technology platforms. Um, and we actually do an assessment, um, des desktop-based assessment, which means we look at their documents and then we um, say whether they meet the different principles in the code. And those that get 100% on the audit report, get certification. And you can also see a list of the um, already certified providers on our website. So far, mainly technology platforms. Um, one is coming from actually um, the uh, Western Australian Department of Primary Industries. So they've, they've created a data platform. So we've got some government in there as well, um, but so far mainly private companies. So I'd love to see more research projects actually coming through. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about the certification process and how that works in case um, any of you would be coming um, to, actually, to actually do it. And so the certification, the code is based around these six principles and those that's where all the certification questions are also based on. So transparency in the first instance is making sure that contracts contain um, some minimum requirements around who the contract is between what's the data that's being that, that's in scope, um, you know, can you get a copy of your data? Where is it stored? What's what are the retention um, rules? Um, how do you terminate the contract? And also, what are the risks around it? Then we've got fairness, which is making sure that the data is not being used for any uh, nefarious purposes that might affect farmers negatively. And also to make sure that if that data is used by, um, by the provider to create some value, that farmers get some share of that value back. So they get recognition for contributing. That doesn't mean always mean uh, monetary value. It could take some other form, but we want that recognition that the farm data did create additional value. Uh, then we've got third, we've got control. And control is about making sure that if you ask for your data to be deleted, then it can be, that, that will be actioned. Um, that you can also control who the data is shared with, um, including uh, parties of your choice. Um, and then portability is making sure you can get a copy of your data, if, whatever you've put in, for example, to a platform. Um, five is security, which is quite obvious. Uh, we know we've got a lot of security risk now out in the IT world so that we've got a quite a comprehensive uh, security checklist that is part of the certification. And that, that is based on the Australian uh, Cybersecurity Centre guidelines. Um, and then last, we've got compliance here, number six, which is about making sure that farm data is not disclosed um, unless required by law and that the farmer is notified if possible of any such disclosure. So that's our six principles. And, and that's what the certification is based on. 
And so why would you follow the code and even get certified? So for farmers, it's knowing what providers they can trust and having NFF give that independent uh, stamp of approval. It, we also provide a summary of the terms and conditions back to the farmer and that's published as part of the audit report um, online. Farmers still advise to get their own legal advice. Um, so, but what we do is give them that first look to say, look, here's a summary of the terms and conditions. If you don't like what you're seeing, you know, then it's saving them time so they don't have to then go through the entire contract. But if they're going to be accepting that contract, they still need to read it, make sure that they're, they've um, provided informed consent. But the, the goal really is to give the farmers as much information as quickly and up, up front as possible so they can make a, a good decision for when they are going to be handing over their data to anyone. And for providers, and again, that includes research, uh, it's a way to create goodwill and differentiate yourself and prove best practice. If you are doing good things, it's a way for you to show that you are. Um, and I've, I've spoken with a few different research institutions and some of the universities who have got a lot of research running. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, big soil, uh, soil information um, pro program going on. And so there's, there's a lot of people wanting to get data from farmers um, and farmers, you know, um, do you want some level of assurance with what their what will be happening with their data? And so the other role of the code is to educate providers on what farmers' wishes are. And that's really how the code came about in the first place is that we were seeing all these problems. Um, so on top of the precision to decision report, which identified the trust issues, there were other problems that were being reported by farmers, such as, um, I've been putting my data into this platform, you know, for five years and now it's been sold overseas. Like who's got my data now? What's happened to it? Also, I want to move off it and I can't because I can't get a copy of my data. So I'm trapped. So there's, 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 the, there's the problems that have kind of coming from, from um, the ground up as well as the research and the policies that have been done through reports like the Precision to Decision Report. Uh, so who is certification for? As I mentioned, it is for projects. So research projects will be included, uh, but mainly for products and services that have direct contracts with farmers. So that's a really important thing. Because the Privacy Act doesn't cover farm data, um, we need to peg this certification to an actual contract and make sure that contract is as favourable to farmers as possible because that is the only legal recourse um, that they have because they don't have... Uh, legislation to fall back on. So if you've got a research project, you can get certified. Um, anyone that's handling farm data that does not have a direct contract with farmers, you can still use the code. You can still apply the principles. You just can't get certified. Um, and I'm always super happy to help anyone, you know, if they've got questions about how they could do that. Um, some of the, uh, some examples of organizations that have, um, approached us to talk about being able to apply the code that don't have direct contracts with farmers. Sometimes I like the supermarkets or retailers where they, you know, they're a few steps removed from the farm gate. Um, so they're, they're still can, they can still do the right thing with the data when they get it, um, if they choose to. So when we get to the Q&A section, I'll be interested in some of your um, use cases and examples of how you collect farm data. So a little bit more about the certification. So um, as I mentioned, it's for products, services, and projects. We review the terms and conditions and all the data policies. And the legal recourse for farmers is through that contract, through the terms and conditions. Um, we don't look at the product quality. So we can't attest to saying, oh, look, you know, you should go with this piece of software because we've assessed it. We're not looking at whether it does a good job and has good functionality. We're really just looking at the data management part. Um, and any, anyone who gets assessed gets an audit report, um, but only those who get 100%, meet the principles 100% get certified. So here's an example of the audit report I showed you before. Probably a, a thing to note here is not everyone's gonna get 100%. Um, and that is absolutely expected. 
with um, where we know that industry is at the moment. And we have set the code um, a bar above. So some of the, um, so it's it's a bar, it's above the Privacy Act. So even if you apply, uh, um, sorry, even if you apply the Privacy Act to farm data as is, we actually have some extra requirements. So for example, um, one of the requirements is that all data breaches get reported um, to farmers under the code, where in the Privacy Act, only um, those events of, that are assessed as of high significance have to be reported. That's why we don't, sometimes we don't find out that a data breach has occurred until later when, they, when the investigation shows that more data is leaked than you thought. But by then, uh, you, know, you may have lost more information than if you'd been told in the first place. So we want farmers to be able to have that, um, to be able to make their own decision of whether that data breach is going to impact them rather than leaving that with the provider to decide on their behalf. So that's one, one example of where the code is um, above what the Privacy Act is for personal information. Um, and so, yeah, I think it just to really drive that point home is that pra the practices are fairly good right now but we have set the bar higher and we really, what we really want to do is uplift the, the expertise and the knowledge around this stuff in the industry. And we know that's going to take time. Um, so we really want people to participate and improve and be transparent about what they're doing because that's acting in good faith and, and building trust with farmers. Even if you're not getting a hundred percent, you're still, you know, you're still putting your information out there and being, and being honest about what you're doing. So that's really important. Um, having said that though, we have had quite a few providers change their terms and conditions and put extra data policies on their websites um, and, and even change some of their platforms to make sure that, you know, for example, if they weren't getting consent to change terms and conditions before, now they have a pop-up and you have to reconsent, so you have an opportunity. So, you know, um, there is definitely uh, willingness to adapt the current practices, which is excellent to see. Uh, great. So what really we're asking the community um, to do is for farmers to actually actively start asking providers if they've been assessed and certified, because this code is really for them. It's come through the Farmers Federation, through all the members and the committees and and gotten the stamp of farmers stamp of approval um, and so now it's um, it's something that we can use as that benchmark and farmers will be looking for the audit reports on the NFF website so we're doing a whole lot of campaigns with farmers as well to make sure they're aware of it and that, that we already started certifying um, projects and providers and then for providers of course to make sure they've got those right policies that give farmers control of farm data and that they are getting assessed and certified and for everyone to give feedback on the code because this is the the document where we can bring where we can get on the same page about what's good or not good to do with farm data and so that code it really is our data governance foundation it's the benchmark that we're measuring against and that's how we're going to build trust and doing it together and contributing to how the code actually evolves and making sure that it's fair. So it's not just, you know, setting a, a impossible benchmark, but also understanding from the provider's side, what's practical and possible to do. And that's been actually a very key thing where we have involved, you know, technology and research um, um, on our working groups to make sure that what we're proposing is actually feasible. So that's been really important that it's a very, um, it's a, it's a, it's a code that can be applied in, in real life. All right, wonderful. So what I might do now is show you the data sharing agreement as well. Now, Kylie, you're going to share you're going to share these slides, aren't you? So people have my contact details. That's right, yes. I'll I'll share the slides um after the session. Okay. Okay, I'll stop sharing and then I'll just get the Data agreement. Oh. How are we going for time? We've got about ten minutes oh. left. So. Oh, absolutely, plenty. Oh, of time. good, good, good. Oh, good. Okay. 
can you see a Word document? Yes, we can. Thanks, Gabby. Zoom is so much quicker than Teams. <laughs> it's really blowing me away. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So we've got the code and the certification. Now, one of the other supporting pieces of work that aligns to the code is the data sharing agreement that has been um, developed by Food Agility CRC. So that was actually um, done in conjunction with uh, one of the uh, law firms, Minta Ellison. And it's quite a, a, I would say, a very comprehensive document. <laughs> Some people say it's long. I say it's very comprehensive. Now, we have actually worked um, on also making this very flexible. So it's very comprehensive, but it's very flexible for a few different situations. And how it's flexible is it has these questions at the back. I want to scroll and hit your eyes. So what we have at the back is a questionnaire where you can answer some of these questions and then it guides you to, to cut out certain clauses to make sure that it's as tailored as possible for your situation. So depending whether you've got one-off transfers or ongoing or both an ongoing and how long, who, how many parties you've got doing the actual data sharing, all these kinds of things, you can go through here and then start cutting out sections from the actual main body of the document. So I think what I really want to, um, to get across is that it may look quite scary when you open it. And it's so it's about 20 pages of clauses and then another 20 pages of schedules. So I'll just explain about how that works. Um, but then you can cut things out as you go because not it's got it covers a lot of scenarios and you can kind of take what you need. That's it's um, that's how it can accommodate a lot of um, different situations. Now it is mainly targeted for research. So it's not this is not um, it's not actually designed to be the terms and conditions of a software platform. It's like we have a one to many, like one platform to many users types of agreements. This is a one, more of a one to one. So if you got a research project and you're going to individual farmers and you're signing those with them, then this is actually the perfect, um, the perfect template to be using. So I'll show you a little bit about. Um, so the body of it will have quite normal clauses like um, like you would expect in the contract. And then you'll have sections that you can cut out depending on what you need and don't need. And all of these have been aligned to the data code version two. So um, it's if you're using this uh, agreement, you've pretty much, you've covered about 90% of the data code already. Where the difference um, happens um, is in the schedules. So I'll show you what a schedule looks like. So a bulk of this document is actually these schedules where you fill in exactly what you're doing. So for example, be what is the data you're sharing? What, are there any exclusions? Who is the farm business that you're dealing with? Is there any private data in the shared data? Um, what's the method of transfer? So a lot of this is where you actually go and fill in what you're doing um, to communicate to farmers what it is that you're going to do with their data, where it's going to go, like how long you're going to keep it for, those types of things. So in a way, it's almost like a data management plan rolled into a contract. So you get a two, you get a two for one. And so once you've kind of gone through here and filled a lot in, all in, um, it really is the basis for um, what you, how you'll be handling that data. Um, there is also, uh, now if I, are you still seeing the same screen or do you see a disclosure statement now? Still seeing the schedule three data sharing details. I'll just show you the other the other document that goes with the so the other Yep, there it is. Thanks. Oh, great. So the other um document, the other template that, that accompanies the data sharing agreement is this disclosure statement. And it's like a, a couple of pages, it's a five, I think a six page summary of what's in the, it's like a cover page if you think about it that way. So she summarizes the contract. And so this is what you may actually present to farmers, which really says who, who are the data recipients? What is the data? How do I terminate this contract? 
Um, what's the purpose for which data is shared? How will it be used? Who are the third parties who may receive the data? Um, how will protected data specifically, which is sensitive, a, a subset, which is like the extra sensitive data, how will that be protected and managed? How will you handle breaches? How will you allow correction of data? How will you provide data portability? What's the, what are the policies for deletion? Any other benefits? All these line up with the data code um, as well. So you kind of, you're giving this a summary of the contract here. And again, this can be that first thing that you show farmers um, and that the rest of the agreement really just sits underneath it. So this is a, a quicker and an easier way to communicate with farmers. And then those two documents go together. So um, there are the actual data sharing agreement mentions the disclo this disclosure template in there. So th this is still legally binding. This disclosure template is still legally binding because it's covered. It's actually part of the data sharing agreement. This is a quick way. It's almost like a, that summary, again, for your data management plan of what's the data, who's getting it, where is it, like how long are you going to hold it for, like those kind of top 10 questions around data um, that everyone wants to know. And then, they, again, they can dig deeper into the detail um, in the actual data sharing agreement. But it, it all lines up together. All right, fantastic. I think I might do some questions now. That's a lot of information and we've kind of got two topics. So we've got the data code and certification, we've got the data sharing agreement, but we can just see, just see what kind of questions come in. Thank you so much, Gabby. That is super, super interesting. And I will I'll just disclose to the group here, I'm a farmer's daughter. So I'm looking at all of this with my farmer's daughter hat on more than my ARDC hat on, I've got to be honest. Um, I'll get the ball rolling. I've got about a million questions. <laughs> um, again, wearing that farmer's daughter hat, could you elaborate a little bit more um, on the engagement process that you had with farmers in the process of developing both of these documents? And did you have any engagement with particular sections of the farming community or one or with some segments more vocal than others? I'd love to know a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. So the initial version one of the uh, data code actually came out in February 2020. That was before I had joined um, the NFF, but that were the original working group, um, there was an original working group that was that had farmers on it, so definitely some cattle farmers and some crop, and then um, there was research and technology, but... The, that version of the code also went through all the committees of the NFF, just like this time where I had um, worked on version two to update it just with some new new things that have happened and some additional protections for farmers. Um, and the way I engaged um, was through one-on-one -on -one interviews, talking at some of the committees and some of the gatherings and the open days um, from the NFF. But generally, the feedback has been excellent. Can you just take care of this stuff because we don't have time, you know, we've got, we've got to pay staff and, it, you know, it's, and it's not about um, digital literacy or anything like that at all. It's literally about time and priorities and, you know, farmers having to be an accountant and a lawyer and a tech person and, you know, and a farmer on top of all those other things. And this is something that just takes some of the burden off. Hmm. Absolutely. And um, yeah, it certainly it's speaking from what my family were like they were um organic farmers on just a few acres north north of perth and these sorts of things would happen in the evening when it's yeah. too dark to work outside or if it's bucketing down with rain and you can't be outside actually doing stuff on the farm so um like certainly for my family recognition that this stuff's important but you got to grow the stuff you got to look after it and everything as as the top priority this is the paperwork behind the scenes yeah it's actually a really interesting thing that has come out in another session we had a couple of months ago, and it was in the health sphere um, where they were working on making um, consent forms that were much shorter and in layperson language um, that were much easier for people to understand and therefore to actually agree to. So really interesting to see a parallel here in yes. a completely different sphere of research. And actually the reason I got this job because I'd come from health and I was working on a um, on a digital tool to 
automate simpler consent forms for genomics. Ah, yeah. yeah, and so that was like one of the reasons. I was like, oh, informed consent, that's really important. Let's go from 40 pages. How do we go from 40 pages to five, you know, of consent, of like consent papers and, you know, often, yeah, in the hospitals, they're done, they're still on paper forms. So I was digitizing them, but also trying to make them more user-friendly while, while offering the same protections. And it's a really hard balancing act, which is why even with the data sharing agreement here, you still need all the legal detail to make sure it's legally sound, but you can have this six-page cover letter and these schedules where you can kind of write your own stuff and put just put in what you're doing in plain English. Um, and then the legal clauses kind of bring it all together, make it legally sound. Yes, it's, it is a hard, hard thing to balance. Hmm. But if you get it right, huge oh, benefits to be yeah. had <laughs> for everybody. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alexis, Absolutely. have you got a question? I just turned my camera on so you didn't have a whole lot of black squares to look at. <laughs> it was really interesting. Um, I think I'm thinking I work at the University of Adelaide in the library and I and Karen Bath is also on here support the agricultural researchers in um, data enabled um, research as well. Um, and we've had a lot of hands on work with them in recent in the last year because of some changes from the funder around data management expectations, major funder in this area. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting to us. Thank you for the presentation. I find I'm thinking a lot about how I, this, I don't know how widely familiar we are with the code. I may actually just have not had opportunity to hear about it from my researchers, but an interesting challenge for the university is that if we were talking about certification against the code, it would be about whether the projects would be certified, which is most, what's most likely yes. to be the application, but then some of the obligations that the person who's being certified, you know, I'm particularly thinking about data breaches and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. that would be the project administration only has a certain lifespan. And so then that's actually more of a university commitment. Mm, and good one. Yeah. We sort one. of, yeah, what would be the best level mm. upon which to act upon this? Because I think in practical terms, the project level is the only, because we do subcontract to farmers to collect mm. data, as many, I think all the other universities here probably do as well. Um, so yeah, just thinking about the application. Very good about, point. Yeah. I like that. Okay. So, yeah, if you're making that longer-term commitment, it would have to be a whole of university kind of commitment. Or, but Yeah, then... if you're holding the data for mm. past the life of the project, then, yeah, mm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we do because we have a um, we have legal requirements around how long mm. we have to hold certain kinds of data and particularly things that have an impact on the environment, um, mm -hmm. which much of this sort of falls can fall into that category. It can be 25 years or that kind of thing. But wow. then when we have things about our security response processes, particularly mm -hmm. like data, data breach is if that's what we're mm -hmm. concerned about. That's very much focused around personal information, which means we're falling exactly in the gap that you've talked about this needing to address. So lots of food for thought for us. Yeah, good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if, I mean, if you had a, a project you wanted to pilot or put through the assessment, that would be really good learning for us as well. Like you're saying, but there's mul multiple levels of responsibility that might occur yeah thank you mm -hmm. yeah Alexis I know the project you're talking about I'm normally based at UWA um, and UWA was involved in that too um, oh my goodness it threw up so many issues particularly around orphan data and people who'd left the university and try and tra track that down was impossible um, and then yeah now undergoing a real education process through School of Agriculture and also Institute of Agriculture we're big on agriculture here in WA um, to try to set up better practices moving forward. And it's really brought up an issue for the library to resolve, which is who's going to be the contact person for that data once the person leaves the university and we haven't actually resolved that issue. So big issue for agriculture, but data management across the board. So yeah, yeah it's definitely caused a lot of head scratching. <laughs> Um, it was a, a tumultuous year working with that project, but um, I think the the hard parts may, the hard parts exactly just show what the value of it was that we did need to improve practices and that um, but also it was a real lesson and perhaps this is where it has a relevance to this as well. It was a real lesson in how much the expectations of the funder can be a motivating lever for change. Um, 
more so than the university just going, oh, this is good practice or that kind of thing. And so perhaps when it comes to encouraging um, adoption of the code, working with funders could be a, a one of the various motivators in the space to say, well, you know, are you compliant with the, the code or something like that? Because, yeah, it was really many of the messages we were getting across to this research community last year were not out of step with what the university just expects as normal, but it was a, a step change. It was a, a considerable cultural change because, and it was motivated to do it because of the funder. Right, yeah. In fact, I had a question, Gabby, about um, where the line is drawn in terms of farm research data. I, I read the data code. It's not long, guys. It's only a few pages. Right? And, it's, and it's got a handy <laughs> flow chart because I'm a, also not and a fan of uh, yeah of text. I love pictures. So um, yeah, there's a handy what, flow chart for explaining yeah. what farm data is. <laughs> yeah, so I was confused about the research data part. So... Am I right in thinking that the data that is actually generated on the farm by farmers, that's farmers' data? The question is if they provide that data to researchers, mm -hmm. is the data that's generated as a result of that research and the analysis still considered farm data or is it not? So that's when the value and the fairness comes in. Then farmers should get some value back but not, will not always, it, it won't always be farm data. So depending if, yeah, if it was, if it was collected on farm, definitely it's farm data. Mm -hmm. If it was collected, um, trying to think of a situation where it wouldn't be. Yeah. So if you've derived it from farm data, so if you created some, a new data set, for example, um, then it wouldn't be, but the, some value should be provided back to the farmer. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it does raise the point of aggregated data as well. So I guess if your farm's data is in an aggregated data set, mm -hmm. you can't tell which bit is your farm, then it's not farm data. But I guess if it's aggregated and, they, and you can tell yes. which farm it's from, then it is farm data. That's yeah. right. And, and it, yeah. well, it's an easy way. It's more about can you, yeah, can you identify if it's anonymized, then a whole lot of the code doesn't actually apply. Yeah. If it's truly anonym, anonymous, and, you know, we do say is you, depending on the, your context, it's important to work with the farmers that you're talking to to make sure that what you, you don't make a decision on their behalf about what is identifying or not. Because mm. like, as I've been discovering talking to farmers, for example, turns out cattle DNA is very much identifying to a particular area and sometimes even to a farm because of a particular, like, because of the breeding program that they may have. And so, you know, it's not just about location or an address or a GPS location or, or names in it and phone numbers. Like it might be um, plant DNA or, you know, animal DNA or even, you know, sometimes the shape of the farm. There's many things that, you know, especially me as a non-farmer, I wouldn't have known and perhaps some researchers out there might not have thought and so the, the message is just make sure you, are, you talk, talk to the farmers, talk to them about what you're going to do with the data and then see if they've got any concerns. And that's really how this will, it's just about bringing, bringing um, the different perspectives together, making sure everyone's comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any other questions out there? I can see a couple of people turn on video, which is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I, I just had a question um, around uh, whether the, the data agreement, um, I think template, for want of a better word, yeah. um, whether there was um, any consultation or thought around notifiable data in that. So as a uh, farmer, uh, if I'm using a platform and I need to record that I've got foot and mouth or I need to record that oh. I've got some sort of invasive pest, which is notifiable, is that included in that? No. No, no, no. Um, we hadn't considered, we, it wasn't, it, there wasn't any consideration for re regulatory requirements or anything like that. But there are sections where, for example, um, where you can kind of add in additional terms and conditions that will suit your particular situation. 
mm-hmm. for sure. So that's like in that schedule, you can kind of fill in like, um, you know, and also you need to do this. So there might be some special conditions that you want to add. Yeah. There is a but- section on data quality. And again, this is one of the, it suits research more than um, commercial platforms. Uh, there is a section on data quality where if you do go through that questionnaire at the back and customize the agreement and you say that you do need data of a certain quality, um, then there is a clause for that. And then you can specify in the schedule, you know, what 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 the requirements are, you know. So if you need a minimum set of fields or a template that you need it to come in. That's often, I know, important for research because you need to harmonize all that data from many sources and it's a massive pain. Yeah, so. Yeah, I, I was just thinking that, you know, if, if you're running some sort of platform or, or for example, you have an, an app that, you know, assists a, a, a farmer to track uh, events on a animal throughout its life, um, you may end up, finding that there's stuff being recorded that under regulations needs to be notified um and it's like yes the onus is on the farmer to do that but is it also a responsibility of the platform ah Um, right so if there's um so that comes under the compliance section number six which is legal disclosure so any disclosure of the data required by law can can just happen like that's not the code can't stop you complying with the law yeah yeah yeah. no 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 that's right so that's where the I think yeah that's where that section kind of kicks in Mm -hmm. thank you sure hi Gabby Arvind here from AgVic um we have a couple of projects in traceability space mostly um and again traceability being all about collecting data and sharing data at different levels um we have been looking into um the exact issue that uh, farm data code is trying to address. I have a couple of questions, but before um, before I jump into those, I just wanted to know if there is um, like it, is there any industry system out there, especially around um, orchard management, um, that is looking into the certification process, or um, has there been any adoption that you are aware of from industry oh, and for order management? Sorry, did you say? Orchard, sorry. Oh, orchard management. No, yeah. we ha- not specifically. No, we haven't had a specific. Okay. Yeah. In yeah, I mean, you can have a look on the um in the list at the moment. We've got a couple. We've got an integration company, so Petri Intelligence is an integration company. We've got um Farm Simple. I think that's more for cattle management. Um, and we've got a couple coming up, but they're not um app. They're not horticulture specific. They're more mm-hmm. general. Hmm. Okay. So um, we, the way our projects operate is that um, like we do work with industry system and try and encourage them to, you know, adapt mm-hmm. these sort of frameworks yes. um, and their existing systems. So obviously that means they get audited and then um, the whole process that you just described. But we also have other projects where we look into developing new systems, addressing those gaps altogether. And uh, I was just thinking, um, given that the farm data code is being proposed um, for auditing and then certification, is there any surveys or you know anything that we can do um, to for that code to be incorporated as part of the development itself from the inception of the system mm-hmm. rather than after it's developed and being used? Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, like as an example. I've been working with a couple of startups who don't even have their platform up and running yet, but they and they don't even have their terms and conditions written, but they're already building the code into those terms and conditions. So they just do it once at the beginning and then they have to go back and retrofit um, their policies and their terms and the actual system. So it's it's good to start early um, and the certification that it with is actually a checklist that guides you through how to meet the code. So okay. if that was something you might be able to use, I can, you know, get um, send me an email and then we'll, we'll have a chat and I'll share with you all the resources um, that maybe we can kind of make work for you. I think, yeah, that would be better because um, I did go through the video on the website and um, I can see the areas that we're trying to address, but then within that specific area is more detailed um, um, in relation to what 
functionalities like the app might have, like because not all of them are designed. Like in, so, for instance, in our case, um, we want to have a data sharing functionality in the app, mm -hmm. um, and we're very mindful of the ownership and privacy and how it's being shared and user like creator being the center of all of that. Mm -hmm. But then I think yeah like um making sure that the underlying details of what it means to share that data from that functionality perspective mm -hmm. um whether we are addressing those mm -hmm. or not like um and if we can uh, thanks for saying that so i think i'll send you an email yes, and please. maybe uh, we can go through what we're trying to do and see if yeah um, absolutely mm -hmm. it's a process great thanks for that but yeah with the industry I mean, we have had challenges. Uh, <laughs> industry is far behind from um, where research has been in terms of it, you know adoption of um, all of this. And the biggest challenge we always run into is that um, the value for them in changing all anything that they do at, at the platform level or you know from legal perspective, and there is not always a very strong motivating factor from to encourage them to do that mm -hmm. unless it's um i think before it was mentioned that if funding bodies are doing that as a requirement or mm -hmm. yeah but if you have any thoughts around how we can also encourage the participants in our research the, them being industry systems mm -hmm. working in that space um so yeah we definitely would I mean, if, yeah definitely through funding so if there's if you've got um grants or funding being made available then um, some that a condition can be, for example, that the farm data code at least has been considered and they have to show their decision for getting certified or not. You know, um, ideally you would require that they get certified and mm -hmm. that, that the um, data management policies would follow the code. But I know that's not always practicable or possible. So is there some small steps we can take um, to lead up to that, the ideal? Hmm. I think I'll yeah, mm -hmm. summarize yeah. what I said and send you an email maybe. Thanks so much. Time. I love that. No, thanks, thanks. Abind. Great. Fantastic. Are there any other questions out there? I've got one more. In fact, I've probably got hundreds. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. any others from our other audience members before I jump in again? Okay, my question was... Um, yeah, you mentioned um, some of the changes that have occurred as a result of companies going through this certification process. For example, there might be, what was that, another pop-up screen to um, really make it clear? Yeah, re-consent re to changes in terms. Yeah, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. Re-consent. Um, do you have any other examples you could share with us of changes that have happened? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Security practices, like, you know, so many, especially, you know, small businesses, who um, could have, you know, just like less than 10 employees, you know, they, they don't have a security expert. They usually have some IT people or they've outsourced it, for example. Um, so it was actually been really good to go through with them with our the more in-depth security checklist that's part of the certification. Because some of the things where they're like, oh, okay, oh, yeah, okay, you know, they'll go, oh, that's a good, oh, that's a good thing to do. We just didn't, we just didn't think of that or know of that. Mm. you know, without going out and getting a security consultant, you know, paying a lot of money for security audits because they're so focused on just getting money in the door to um, to get users on. And then you kind of start thinking about those other things, you know. So not, I'm not saying their apps are insecure. I'm just saying that it's a different level. Like you can you can go to levels of, of detail and, and being comprehensive around these things. You know, I've come from banking as well. So bank level security is you know, insane, probably much like government. So, um, and we would never expect that level to be what a start startup would do. So we actually have two versions of that security list for those who are under 10 million revenue and those who are over, and there's a higher requirement, you know, but even the basic one is kind of just, it has a lot of good prompts for those starting out as well. Um, what, are, what are some of the other things? Just getting more information out on their website so a lot of the providers are doing all the right things but they don't describe it anywhere so the contract isn't always the right it's not the place to put everything in in it you know about what you're doing sometimes you don't you don't put your security policies in a contract you know there's, there's other ways of communicating these things that don't have to be through the contract so we actually 
That's why we assess the contract and their data policies and what they communicate on their website. You know, make sure that whatever farmers are seeing has the full picture, whether in whatever way or shape that comes across. So most people have been keen to put up some like frequently asked questions or a page on their data policies or, you know, their um, what they do or don't do with the data that's over and above the contract. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah and I think it's um, an interesting idea that by following this process, you're encouraging best practice. And, again, thinking back to when my parents were on the farm, um, when they started up on the Want to Be Organic and back in the day it was... NASA with two A's on the end, National Association for Sustainable Agriculture Australia, I it's stood for back in the memory bank. Um, so they have different levels of certification. Yes. Um, so there was a level B, um, which you got to put your orange stickers on all your oh, hands yeah. or whatever it was that you were growing, um, which meant you were in transition from conventional uh, yes. or you were just starting out. Um, yep. in the organic farming, which is what mum and dad were doing. But then um, you could go to level A, um, which was the top level, you could put your green sticks on yeah. <laughs> um, And because from the outset they knew they wanted to achieve this certification, that informed their practices in actually yes. setting up the farm and how it was managed. So it was, um, yeah, really high-level guidelines for them to achieve on the way through, mm -hmm. um, which was super helpful because... Although they're experienced farmers, they both grew up on wheat and sheep farms and switch into organic farming at that small scale. Um, I've got to go out of this room and see. Um, <laughs> yeah, just gave them some guidelines to work with so that they could achieve it quickly. As I mentioned, I need to wrap this up because I'm getting kicked out of the making room. <laughs> I've the top of the hour. Thanks again mm -hmm. so much, Gabby. This has been super, super interesting and great to have a few people on the call who are actually working with um, farmers and agricultural data in different ways. Um, so, yes, I will share the link to the recording and the slides. And, yeah, thank you and have a good thank day. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah. Bye.